Hey, welcome to Return of the King. This is a series where we're going through the book of Revelation chapter by chapter to see what the Bible really has to say about the end of the world. In this study, we want to try to get away from what systems say and what speculation says and just kind of really get into the Word of God and see what it says plainly to us today. Hey, I'm Randy Bond. I've been a pastor for over 25 years, and this is a series that we've been going through with our church, and we're very happy to have you joining with us today. And today, uh, we are looking at what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Uh, we're getting into uh, Revelation chapter 2, uh, the letters to the seven churches. And uh, this is part one of this. We're going to break this up because there's a whole lot here. And we'll do chapter three in part two. Um, as we uh, were looking at last uh, episode in Revelation chapter one, uh, J John encounters the resurrected, glorified, ascended Jesus. And the very first thing that Jesus tells him is this instruction, this command uh, to write down what he sees and hears uh, and send this to the seven churches, and specifically to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, to Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, uh, these are all actual cities that were existing at the time of John uh, in what is now modern day Turkey. Uh, at that time, uh, it was a Roman province known as Asia Minor. Uh, and all of these are really on the coastal side, so on the western side of uh, Turkey. And if you look down at the bottom left, uh, you can see the island of Patmos. This is where John had the vision. He was exiled here uh, because of the Word of God and his testimony in Jesus. And uh, it's here that he has uh, this revelation, this uh, vision or series of visions that is the book of Revelation that we have. Uh, you'll notice that here are those seven uh, cities and the seven churches uh, that are mentioned there in uh, Revelation 1. Uh, there's uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So if you've ever wondered, why are they in that order and uh, why these? Uh, these are basically on a mail route. Uh, these are on uh, the major highway system that would have run around. And this would have been a circular letter where all the churches probably would have read all the letters to all the other churches. Um, Ephesus was the first one mentioned because it's the first uh, closest major port to Patmos. And that would have been uh, where that letter would have been transported to most naturally. It's also uh, where Paul spent a lot of his time, probably the most significant amount of time when Paul was doing his missionary journeys. He stayed there a very long time. We're going to come back to Paul in a moment. But John also uh, was the bishop, the pastor of the church at Ephesus. So there's a, a very close connection that uh, John had to probably not only the Ephesian church, but these other Christians and other churches in the area. So he was not an unknown known to many of these people that he's writing to, but probably very well known in the region. And then this would have just followed that route that um, all of these uh, churches would have gotten all of these letters, uh, as I mentioned. So we're going to look at the first four today in Revelation chapter 2, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and Thyatira. Stay tuned for the next episode coming up, and we'll catch the final three there on the other side. Um, by the way, as we're going through this, if you have any questions or comments, I hope you'll leave those in the uh, comment section down below. Always love to hear your feedback and insights. Sometimes it's really good. Sometimes it's really interesting, uh, but it's always a, a joy for me to hear that, particularly if you found something uh, helpful, uh, some new insight that you've gotten. And if you do find anything helpful, uh, anything that is uh, interesting in this, I hope that you'll give the video a like that helps YouTube to know that this is a value. I'm a small channel, uh, and this just kind of helps to get the word out there, probably more than what you realize. Uh, between a like and a, a comment, that's a big, big deal. And certainly, if you don't want to miss any of the others that we do in the series, I hope you'll subscribe and uh, hit that notification bell. Uh, that way, you'll be notified. We're trying to get these out right now while we're transitioning from our ministry assignment in uh, Italy back to the States, uh, doing these about once a week, uh, but we'll pretty soon get these back up to two a week, Lord willing. So uh, let's jump right into Ephesians chapter two. Uh, starting in verse one, uh, here is what we see Jesus saying to the church at Ephesus. To the uh, angel of the church, uh, excuse me, <laughs> to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, 
and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Uh, so what we're going to see throughout all seven of these letters is a very clear pattern. Uh, the first thing is the, uh, the, 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 the particular church that it's being written to. And we're going to try to get some of the uh, historical or uh, geographic background that might give a little bit of insight as to why Jesus says some of the, the particular things that he says to that particular church. The second thing is that uh, we see Christ revealed. There is going to be a lot of repetition of the way that Jesus reveals himself in John chapter 1. All of these are very important to the situation, uh, either that they're dealing with externally or internally uh, as a church. So uh, Christ is going to present himself in a way that is relevant to the situation. Uh, third is going to be a commendation. Uh, what Christ is finding that the church is doing well. Uh, and then he's going to maybe mention a complaint. And then third, or I'm sorry, fifth, <laughs> lost count there, uh, would be the correction. Uh, how do we fix this complaint? And then finally, it's the consequence or the judgment if the person does not, or if the church does not repent and uh, do the correction that uh, Christ gives. And then finally uh, is the crown of the overcomer. So in every one of these, there's going to be a mention, uh, depending on your translation to the one who overcomes um, uh, or to the conqueror, uh, that's the, the same kind of thing. The one who is victorious, the one who is enduring to the end, who is remaining faithful, there's going to be a reward that is mentioned for this. And I use crown just kind of as an alliteration there, uh, but that's the, the reward, the promise that if you are faithful to me, this is what will happen at the end. So um, as we're looking at this, one of the things that we notice is that judgment begins with the house of God. We're reminded of this, that well before judgment day comes, Jesus deals with his churches in the here and now. Not all judgment is reserved for the day of the Lord. Uh, we're reminded that Jesus is very uh, deeply connected with his churches, and he's very concerned about the health of the churches. And so he will speak his complaints, and he will speak his corrections, and he expects that correction to be made. Um, so let's look at how this plays out with the church at Ephesus. So Ephesus was probably the most important city of the seven. This is a major port. Uh, we had the Temple of Artemis here, um, and, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, if you remember when Paul uh, had traveled there, uh, so many people were leaving the worship of Artemis. They were leaving their idolatry behind to follow Christ exclusively. Uh, that the silver makers, the ones who were making these uh, silver idols of Artemis and other kind of religious artifacts were losing money. Now, they um, made like, well, you know, uh, this is hurting the religion. Uh, but we know the real motivation was it was hurting their bottom line. Uh, so they gather the city basically into the Colosseum there thousands of people, and it almost in, turns into a riot, um, and they were wanting to tear Paul to shreds. Um, the, finally, the, the mayor, basically, of the, the town comes out and says, guys, listen, you know, we are uh, in danger of being charged with riot by Rome, and we'll lose our standing as a free city here uh, if you don't go home. Uh, so this was a huge event centered around that worship of Artemis. Um, so uh, this one, again, is probably listed first because it is the closest port to Patmos. And maybe it had to do with the personal connection that John uh, had as former pastor of that church. So how does uh, Jesus reveal uh, himself? Uh, he uh, reminds them of the, what we saw in chapter one. He is the one who holds the seven stars. Uh, if you remember from chapter one, uh, the seven stars are the messengers, the angels of the churches. I think probably the human pastor, but it could mean a spiritual angel. Uh, I, I'm not going to get worked up on that. Um, and he walks among the seven lampstands. And we're told very clearly, lampstands represent churches. 
Now, what Jesus has uh, good to say about them is he knows their works, their hardworking church, uh, their labor, their patience, their per perseverance. They've been putting up with a lot. Uh, they have zero tolerance of false doctrine, false teachers, and they hate the works of the Nicolaitans. By the way, this is a godly characteristic of a good church, that we don't tolerate uh, false teaching, false doctrine, and even using this word hate. Because if you remember, uh, he commends them uh, after the complaint. He says, um, you've lost your first love, but you have this. You hate the, the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So this is reflecting the heart of Jesus uh, toward false teachers and false teaching is not to put up with it, not to, uh, to treat it in a way where uh, we think, well, it's okay. You can believe what you want to be. You be you, you do you, uh, we'll be us kind of thing. But there, And it's not to say that we go to other churches or uh, groups with torches and pitchforks. That is not at all what, what I'm saying is that in our hearts and in our church, we need to guard truth carefully. Now, the complaint uh, that comes, sorry about that. Um, uh, actually, uh, yeah, th this is a, uh, a reminder that when Paul uh, was coming back uh, to Jerusalem, he stopped by to meet with the Ephesian elders. Now, he didn't get to meet with them in Ephesus, but in uh, Acts chapter 20, uh, he goes and he calls for the elders to come and meet him there. And when they do, I mean, the, the elders uh, are realizing this is the last time we're going to see Paul. Um, and they are weeping hot tears on his neck. But Paul's warning to them as he's leaving, this is Ephesus, the church that's getting this letter. He says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. Here's the good news. What we can tell from the letter to the church at Ephesus, they took this to heart. They're not tolerating the false teachers, the ones that are coming from the outside and the ones that are rising up internally. Uh, and sometimes it's the internal threats are the ones we see the least uh, or deal with the slowest. Sometimes it's easier to recognize those that are coming in from the outside, but not always. Sometimes those coming in from the uh, outside have celebrity status. They already have kind of this credibility about them that a lot of people are listening to and following and that they go, oh, we should do this too. And we should believe this too. And, and so that's where we have problems. But the church at Ephesus was being very careful about measuring the doctrine against the truth. Whatever was being taught was being measured against, weighed against the word of God. Um, but the complaint was, and this is a big one, they left their first love. This is a church that is solid biblically. They are solid theologically, but somehow along the way, they've been very active. They've been doing a lot of good things, but somehow or another, this has become a little bit more externalized, uh, where it is not coming out of the heart, not out of a heart of love toward God, and maybe not out of a heart of love uh, toward each other. So uh, we're not exactly told the object of the love that has been lost here. We're just simply saying, uh, or he's simply saying they've lost their first love, which makes me kind of think he's talking about the love toward God. There has been a, a shift in their hearts away. The correction is to remember and repent. Remember where they were before. Remember the heights at which they were, and then repent to stop doing what they're doing and do the right thing. Um, do the first works, the first works of love that they were doing toward uh, him, uh, of Jesus, and maybe even toward each other. Now, the consequence, if they do not do this, is um, the removal of the lampstand. This is huge because this means that they would cease to be a true church. Remember Revelation 120 asks for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. What Jesus is threatening here is you will cease to be a church. Remember, Jesus said, um, uh, by this, the world will know you are my disciples, by your love for one another. Love is not an incidental or accidental thing within the life of the church. It has got to be at the core of who we are as much as sound doctrine. Um, now, for those who do overcome, uh, to the one who conquers, to the one who overcomes, here is the promise access to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. This is a reference to eternal life.
Uh, we see this in Revelation chapter 22, and it seems to be kind of a reference even back to the Garden of Eden with the Tree of Life there. But looking more forward to that, uh, getting to live in the new Jerusalem, on the new heaven, new earth, uh, in perfect fellowship with God eternally. Um, so every one of these letters is going to end with this refrain. You hear this over and over. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is a listen closely, and this is a listen everybody. This is not just a letter for the church at Ephesus, but this is a letter for all of us that we need to take some things away. That yes, absolutely, it was written uh, specifically to the church at Ephesus for specific situations that they uh, were dealing with. But all of these letters went to all of the churches and they are uh, to be read, heard, and, and heeded in the same way that we need to read all of these, hear it and heed it. This is the same kind of expression um, that Jesus uses in the book of John, the gospel of John, uh, that when Jesus is about to say something really important or when he has said something really important, he says this, he who has an ear, let him hear. Listen up and do what it says. So what do we take away from uh, the church at Ephesus? Um, solid doctrine, fervent activity, a, a very active church are commendable. But without love of Christ in his body, a church may face judgment and even removal by Christ. Now, don't conflate the, the, the meanings of the word judgment and wrath. Those are not necessarily tied as the same thing. Judgment has a redemptive element, that it is a punishment or a discipline brought into a person's life for wrongdoing or uh, a wrong direction with the intended result of bringing them back. The remedy is always repentance, that we stop doing the old thing and we start doing what God has intended for us to do. So even a church can face judgment. Christians can face judgment well before judgment day, but in life here and now. We even see this in um, the warnings in the Lord's Supper that if we eat it in an unworthy way, that we may face judgment. And Paul says, for this reason, some of you are sick and some have even died uh, because you've been doing this in an unworthy way. Um, so the, the Spirit clearly calls us to pay close attention. The message to the seven churches is a message for all churches of all time. So we need to listen carefully. This is not for entertainment purposes only. Uh, this is for life transformation uh, for churches and for individuals. So a word of caution, don't hear this and get judgmental about your church or about other churches. If you see things that are going on, this should lead you to prayer. It, it, you should be taking this to the Father, not to Facebook. You need to be uh, pleading with the Lord to bring about the change that is necessary. This does not set us up to be judgmental. Jesus is the judge, and we need to be careful in the way that we talk about the bride. So let's be cautious and careful there. Um, but I do also want to note that the seven churches do not represent seven church age, ages. Um, I've heard this from you know a number of different people along the way. But it, and and basically the idea is this: that each of these churches represents a different age within the church. That uh, the church, the early church, started out like the church of Ephesus, and then it will finally and ultimately end up like the church at Laodicea. And that the church has gone through and will go through these various phases until we get to the end. It is not indicating ages of the churches. If it's indicating church ages, then why do we see examples of all of these churches in every age of the church? No matter when you look back in time, and if you just look around today, you're going to find churches that are like Ephesus, where they are solid doctrinally, very active, but dead. Uh, you're going to find churches uh, like some of the others we see that have done doctrinal compromise. You're going to find churches that are apathetic and lazy and complacent like Laodicea. But you're also going to find churches like Smyrna that are on fire for the Lord, and there is no complaint. And so we want to be careful that we're, we're not getting locked into some arbitrary idea, um, because it, it's really easy to, to take things and say, oh, this means this and this when there's no biblical backing to that. And so I want to be careful that what I am believing, what I'm holding to has solid scriptural foundation and not just some kind of arbitrary assigning of meaning to that. So hope that helps. 
Uh, second church is the church at Smyrna, verses 8 through 11. It's a little bit shorter one here. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So Smyrna was known as the first city. It was the glory of Asia. This was a remarkably beautiful city. It said that if you uh, walked down a particular street of Smyrna, uh, uh, yeah, of Smyrna, uh, that the the city uh, looked like a throne, a, a gleaming throne sitting up on the hillside. Um, and another interesting tidbit about Smyrna is that it was destroyed in 580 BC, and then it was later built in 290 BC. The city was known to have been dead, but came to life again. Hmm. How did Christ reveal himself, the first in life, who was dead and came to life? Smyrna is not as great as it thinks it is. Jesus is the one who truly was dead and truly came to life, and he will never die again. And so our hope needs to be not in the political uh, governments and so forth of the area, but our hope needs to be in Christ and in Christ alone. Commendation, Jesus knows their tribulation and their poverty. They have been suffering a lot for the sake of the name. They're losing out financially because they are followers of Jesus. They've been losing jobs, losing work. And because of that, that has led to poverty in an otherwise wealthy city. And they've also been slandered by the synagogue of Satan. So notice, these are people who are Jews. They call themselves Jews. They have a synagogue. They are Jewish people in the, the, their lineage, in their heritage, but listen to the assessment. God calls them a synagogue of Satan. And that's significant uh, because there is no scripture anywhere. And somebody's going to light up the comments here, but there is no scripture anywhere that teaches a universal salvation of Jewish people. It's just not there. Um, and, and so here we see clearly in their day, there were Jewish people who were not believers um, and they, uh, they were persecuting the church at Smyrna. And they are labeled by Jesus as not a synagogue of God, but a synagogue of Satan. Um, the complaint from Jesus, none. This is one of the rarities in these uh, seven churches is that Jesus has absolutely nothing bad to say about them. Um, so his encouragement, not, um, uh, not a, a complaint or a correction, but the encouragement was don't fear what you're about to suffer. Satan will throw some of you into prison for 10 days. Be faithful unto death. And so here is just kind of this caution of, look, you guys are doing great. It's about to get really difficult. Don't, don't be afraid of the tribulation that's coming your way. Um, Satan, through the agency of maybe the synagogue of Satan or through the government more particularly, um, is going to indeed uh, uh, imprison some of the believers. And there's that threat of death that comes. And so that, that call there that we see throughout the book of Revelation is be faithful unto death. Don't shrink back. Um, by the way, they are uh, losing out on a lot of finances, and yet Jesus calls them rich. It's entirely possible to be materially rich and spiritually poor. And, and far, far better is to be materially poor and spiritually rich. Uh, having spiritual wealth and, and um uh, and material wealth do not necessarily equate as a one-to-one. -one. By the way, neither do spiritual poverty and, and material poverty, uh, but we need to be careful that we're putting the priority on the right thing. Because when Jesus looks at our lives, he wants to know where we're counting the treasures, where we are valuing things. And so for uh, the church at Smyrna, they valued that faith in Christ. They valued that loyalty to Christ. And so they weren't about seeking the material things, material gain. They were about seeking gaining Christ. Uh, so the consequence or judgment, really not any. Um, 
But here, I just want to bring you a little example uh, from one of the bishops of uh, Smyrna, uh, probably a little bit later than when this letter was written. But Polycarp was actually a disciple of John the Apostle. He knew John personally, had been discipled by John. Eusebius uh, recounts that uh, or uh, uh, relates that he had been a disciple of the apostles, and particularly John is mentioned. So he knew John well, and when he was 86 years old, uh, he was uh, brought before the proconsul because he had failed to offer a pinch of incense to the genius of Caesar. He did not do his annual worship of Caesar, um, and he never did, but then finally he got called into account for it. And so when he was uh, brought um, uh, before the proconsul, uh, the proconsul told him, uh, look, um, uh, swear by the genius of Caesar and say away with the atheist. <laughs> Polycarp looks at the crowd, waves his hand at the crowd and says, away with the atheist. He doesn't renounce Christ. He doesn't uh, proclaim any kind of allegiance to Caesar. He just dismisses them as the atheists that they are. And uh, he's like, look, have an account for your age, the, the proconsul says. And, and Polycarp's like, look, I've served Christ for 86 years. He's never done me wrong. Why would I turn on him? So the proconsul says, um, I've got wild animals. <laughs> Polycarp says, call them. I love that. Eventually, uh, the conversation goes back and forth. Uh, he th uh, the proconsul threatens Polycarp with fire. Polycarp says, you threaten me with fire that lasts an hour, not realizing that there is eternal fire waiting the ungodly to be punished forever a faithful witness all the way to the end, um, a shining example of the Christians in Smyrna and their allegiance to Christ in the face of death, in the face of imprisonment. And you can see this incredibly in Polycarp. Polycarp is eventually sentenced and dies, uh, burned alive at the stake. And he did that in such a glorious Christ honoring way. So just wanted to bring a, a, a person from church history to bear on this, just to kind of give you an idea a little bit about the church in Smyrna. So again, there is no consequence or judgment against them. There's no complaint. There's no consequence against them. For the crown, those who overcome will be given the crown of life, and they will not be touched by the second death. Eternal life, the lake of fire uh, is no threat to them. So again, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So what do we take away from Smyrna? All real churches must endure some degree of tribulation, even those that Jesus has no complaints against. Tribulation is not, does not come as a result of sin or missing the mark in any way. Tribulation comes from the world because we look and smell like Jesus. And so sometimes because we look and smell so much like him, that's precisely why tribulation comes. Um, 2 Timothy 3.12, all that will live, uh, will live godly shall suffer persecution. Kind of the reality, the expectation for believers, for churches as a whole. Acts 14, excuse me, 14.22 says we must go through much tribulation and enter the kingdom of God. Um, church at Pergamum is our next church here. Uh, we see, uh, starting in verse 12, a little bit longer on this section, five verses here, and to the church, uh, uh, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Wow. Yet you hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. By the way, let's just pause right here. Our geography has nothing to do with our faithfulness. Our political situation has nothing to do with our faithfulness. Our faithfulness, <laughs> uh, our loyalty to Christ is all that matters. Uh, Christ supersedes all geography, all governments, everything. 14, here's the complaints, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. 
and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So the church here is Pergamum. This was the capital city of the province of Asia. Very, very important city politically. This is the home to the imperial cult. This is where the altar is. Uh, that they would make the, the sacrifices, the pinch of incense to, um, uh, to Caesar. Uh, this was a part of um, being a Roman citizen was that you had to worship Caesar. He was counted among the gods. Uh, the temple of Zeus was also here. So the king of the gods. Uh, so this is a very, very important city. And here is how Christ reveals himself is that he's the one with the true power. He's the one with the two-edged sword, the word of authority, the word of power. Uh, as we looked in chapter one, when he comes in uh, Revelation chapter 19, he doesn't have to lift a pinky. All he has to do is speak the word. The one who spoke the universe into existence can speak his enemies out of existence. That's real authority. And that's the contrast with the city of Pergamum. Commendation, faithfulness. In the face of martyrdom, uh, Antipas is one of the servants that's there, one of the martyrs. We don't know really a whole lot about uh, Antipas, so, uh, but they did. Uh, they knew that he had been killed uh, for the testimony of Jesus. And this is what Jesus is talking about. Jesus recognized that martyrdom and reminds them of that. And he also says, you live where Satan's throne is. Now, this could be a reference to the temple of Zeus. It could be a reference to the imperial uh, palace or, or whatever that, that was there as the capital. I think maybe the, the temple of Zeus as kind of the, the chief of the gods uh, is what this is referencing. But it was an evil place. It's spiritual darkness. But they are faithful, 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 even in the midst of an, the darkest city that is mentioned among these. Hmm. Uh, but there's a problem. They have tolerance, tolerance of false doctrine and immorality. Uh, Balaam, uh, Numbers chapter 25 is where we find him. He was a prophet, not a prophet of God. He was a, a, a pagan prophet. And for whatever reason, God spoke to him and through him. Uh, so if you remember, Balak, the king of the Midianites, um, wanted to hire this, uh, this false prophet Balaam to curse uh, Israel as they were coming out. They were doing that marching, the uh, wandering in the wilderness, and they were encroaching on the territory. And so uh, Balak wanted him to pronounce this uh, curse upon them. Um, and Balaam said, look, I can only say what Yahweh tells me to say. Three times he blesses instead of curses. Um, and, and this really, really frustrated uh, Balak. Balaam really wanted Balak's money. And since he could not say curses, he devised a way to have God curse them. And that was he lured them with the Midianite women to seduce the men and have them participate in the worship of Baal and in the sexual immorality. So this is kind of a clue about what's happening here. They don't have a guy there named Balaam. He's acting in sort of the same way of this uh, sexual immorality, um, compromising sexually and maybe even compromising uh, with idolatry. Uh, this idea that I can go to church and I can do these things over here as well. And this seems to be that there were some within the church that were doing this. It was known within the church and the church did not exercise church discipline. And so the complaint is you're tolerating this and you should be dealing with this. The uh, other group that is mentioned is the Nicolaitans. We know nothing about the Nicolaitans. If anyone tells you, we know what the Nicolaitans are. They're making stuff up. Uh, there just has not really been anything clear and conclusive on that. Um, the uh, correction is to repent. You're going to hear this over and over again, and it's always the same. Repent. That means to confront and remove the false doctrine and the immorality, and maybe even remove those, if they don't repent, from the body. So we don't need to tolerate people within the church that are living in sin and openly so, uh, we need to make sure that uh, there is a heart of repentance within people, that if they're confronted with sin, that they need to turn from that. If they're uh, holding on and trying to teach or promulgate some kind of false teaching within the church, um, that that needs to be confronted and dealt with. And if not, they need to be removed. We need to use those Matthew uh, uh, processes there of um, meeting and walking through the steps of church discipline. Um, the consequence... Notice he is the one who has the two-edged sword, and he is the one who normally uses that sword against his enemies. But here he says, I'm going to come against you. Jesus is going to come against you with that sword. 
that is a, a blood run cold kind of thing to think of Jesus coming against you. This word that is normally used, like we say in Revelation chapter 19 against his enemies, he'll bring that against the church there. Uh, the crown of the overcomer, uh, they're given hidden manna, um, the, the provision of God, the food of God in some way. Uh, don't fully understand what that means. Uh, and then a white stone and a new name. Here's what the white stone means. I have no idea. <laughs> no, there's some possibilities here. One is the, the, the new name may be on that white stone. And God has frequently throughout scripture changed the names of people. Uh, Abram went to Abraham. Uh, Jacob went to Israel. And this was not just the change of a moniker, uh, just the sounds that we make to get someone's attention. It's a changing character. And as new creatures in Christ, as those who uh, conquer, who overcome, there's this promise of this new character in him. And it seems to be that this white stone represents that new name, that new character is indelible. Uh, it's unchangeable. Uh, and that the whiteness would represent that purity. And that's kind of speculative, uh, but that's my best guess about what that means because we're not clearly told exactly what that means. If you've got some ideas about what that is, I'd love to hear that. Leave that in the comments below. You might understand more on that than I do. Uh, I think we're all learning together on this. And again, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So what do we learn from Pergamum? Doctrinal compromise is a cancer that Christ will not tolerate in the church. Balaam was an outsider and seems to picture the world beckoning to Christians to adopt or adapt doctrine. And we see this so much today. Um, trying to uh, infiltrate the church and being very successful in many different groups of trying to get the church to change its position on what God has very, said very clearly about gender and sexuality. And uh, we cannot, we cannot compromise with the world. We need to remain loyal to Christ, and we do not to tolerate that within the church. When we heard about um, you've lost your first love with the church at Ephesus, love does not mean compromise. Uh, love does not mean that we abandon truth. It's truth and love are these two things that we see standing side by side throughout these letters. And, and both are held uh, to very high esteem and not one necessarily to the greater of the other. Uh, we don't reduce down to the lowest common denominator so that we can get together and, and be friends and happy and unified and all those kind of buzzwords that get thrown around. What we need to do is be unified in Christ and who Christ is and what Christ expects of us and uh, all that uh, he, he tells us about what church is supposed to be in the Christian life. Second, we cannot compromise theologically or ethically, um, and this would include those sexual ethics, in order to be at odds with the world around us. This is a church that's in the place of the greatest spiritual darkness and the greatest pressure to compromise, and they did not. Uh, but they, they were tolerating that, uh, but we should not uh, tolerate. They were remaining faithful to Christ, uh, but there were those that were uh, uh, deviant from that, and they were tolerating that, but they needed to correct that, and we should too. Third, in an effort to avoid conflict or war with culture, we might find ourselves uh, warring against Christ or Christ warring against us. You need to choose your conflict. Um, I'm going to go with conflict with the world, uh, because as we saw as the way that Jesus reveals himself, he's the one with the true authority, uh, even though they're in the capital city and they've got the imperial cult there and all this, uh, that is the being the capital city in a Roman uh, province, I would rather have conflict with the world than conflict with Christ because Christ wins every time and not pleasantly so. Uh, Church of Thyatira, our fourth and last one for today. So thanks for hanging around this long. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. And if you've been finding anything helpful, I hope that you'll uh, give this a thumbs up even now. Uh, it's just a, a nice thank you. Uh, I, I put in over 50 hours a week to every one of these episodes um, because I want to bring you uh, what's good and right and accurate as, as much as I can. And that's not a claim to say I know everything. Uh, I am still learning and still have hundreds more hours to go before I, I fully understand everything. So verse 18, to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman, Jezebel, 
who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, uh, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Um, so Thyatira is the home to the temple of Apollo. Uh, Apollo, remember, is the son of Zeus, the son of God, uh, the, the chief God. And this is also a, a merchant city, and it was filled with a lot of these merchant guilds. Uh, you had um, your, uh, your fabric guilds and uh, uh, carpenter guilds and a lot of the different guilds, banking guilds and so forth that were there in Thyatira. It, being a part of the guild was not just simply a business association. Every one of them had a patron god and part of their regular practices was to offer sacrifices to that God. In order to be a part of the guild, you had to uh, ritually take part in these uh, sacrifices and the worship of the gods. If you did not, you could not be a part of that guild. And that would mean a lot of financial stress on you if you were not part of the guild. Uh, it's like being part of a union or not. Uh, it can be very detrimental in some areas if you're not part of a union. And this would be even more so in that area at that time. So how is Christ revealed? He is the son of God. He is the true son of God, not Apollo, Jesus. And so here's that stark contrast, uh, bold statement. Uh, Apollo ain't nothing. I am the real deal. Eyes like flame of fire, feet uh, are burnished bronze. He is the one who judges. And this is kind of the warning now also to the church. Commendation, uh, he knows their works, um, their love. This is a good commendation. Faithful servant, uh, service and patient endurance. They've got some good things going for them. But here's the big, big problem. They're tolerating a false prophetess named Jezebel. And uh, this is not necessarily her, her name literally. Uh, this is um, figured on the typology of the Jezebel, the queen, the, the wife of Ahab in uh, First and Second Kings that we see who led northern kingdom of Israel into a lot of idolatry. She is the reason why Baal worship was so um, uh, intense uh, in northern Israel, even to the point that she is killing the true prophets of Yahweh. Uh, she is wanting to exterminate Yahweh worship, uh, bring in the, uh, the Baal worship, uh, maybe even the Molech worship and so forth. Uh, but uh, part of that was the idolatry and the sexual immorality. Now, remember in Revelation, immorality can mean uh, little physical sexual immorality, but it can also be uh, kind of a euphemism for spiritual Im uh, immorality where there is the worship of other gods uh, that is going on. This corruption of the pure worship of uh, Jesus alone, of, of God alone, uh, and, and, and having alongside that uh, other forms of worship, other things. And this is what she is teaching, and they are allowing her to teach. And uh, this is um, a horrible thing that is now coming in. And we don't really know if she's come from within. It seems to be, if I remember right, that she came from within and is teaching this. And this is devastating the church because it's uh, introducing this horrible doctrine into the life of the church and this horrible sexual and um, idolatrous practice. So it may be that what she is saying to them is, sure, it's okay. Go ahead, eat the, the food sacrifice to idols. And it's okay if you go there because they're not really idols at all. Or maybe you need to cover your basis. I don't really know, uh, but it seems to be that she is somehow giving some kind of uh, permission uh, or encouragement to have idol worship alongside the worship of Christ, that they can have multiple allegiances. But what we see very clearly in this, that is not permissible. So the correction is to repent. 
Uh, and notice that not everyone is doing this. There is a remnant within this church that is remaining completely loyal to Christ, and they're not doing that. And so uh, you hear Jesus saying, hold fast until I come. Keep doing what I'm doing. Don't move over into the compromise. Stand firm, stand strong. Then we see the consequence that um, Jezebel has been given time to repent. Jesus has been aware of this. Somehow or another, there has been this patience on his part that he uh, has given her this opportunity to repent. So maybe she is truly a believer, uh, but she's doing uh, these abominable sort of things. And he's given her that opportunity before his judgment comes on her. But then the warning comes, look, if you don't, I'm going to kill you and all of your children, meaning all of her followers. This is a sobering thing. I remember uh, years ago when I was in seminary in Canada, a uh, pastor from uh, Vancouver uh, told me about a, a deacon uh, that was in his church, and he was just obstinate. He was always kind of roadblocking everything uh, and, and was being kind of divisive. And um, the pastor told him, look, I am praying that God will remove you or kill you. And um, the, the deacon said, look, God's going to have to kill him because I'm not going anywhere. And one week later, they had his funeral. Uh, God is serious about his church. Uh, sometimes he is patient, like we see even with Jezebel, um, that he doesn't always work on our timetable. We wish that he would take out false preachers and teachers like that. Uh, but sometimes he's being patient for their benefit uh, because crazy enough, sometimes he still loves them too. And that's a good thing because he still loves us even when we mess up really bad. Um, uh, and so um, the, the, the promise is that those who do overcome, even this, um, uh, this false doctrine that is within the church, they are given authority over the nations uh, and they will rule. That's one of the things that we see is this promise of uh, the people of Christ uh, ruling with Christ on his throne. And I don't fully understand what all that means. This is just a promise. And I'm looking forward to seeing what that means. I think this also means that there's going to be different levels of authority that are given based on how faithful we are here and now. We'll talk more about that in the two judgments as we get toward the end of the book of Revelation. But for now, just kind of park that idea in there. It's kind of a cool thought. And then he says he promises to give them the morning star. This one is very elusive. There's not a whole lot within commentaries and so forth that can clearly identify. There are some uh, various ideas about what this is. I think it's really a reference to himself, uh, that he is promising himself to uh, the people. And that's really our great hope is to know and be in the presence of Christ and know him face to face. Ah, what a great day that will be. So what do we learn from Thyatira? Uh, Jezebel, uh, the false prophets came from within the church. Satan will attack and pressure from both outside and inside. And we are warned to watch for false teachers and to test their teaching. Listen, especially today, if someone is claiming to be a prophet, a prophet or a prophetess, saying that they have a clear word from God, a direct word from God, God told me that raises all kinds of red flags for me. And I'm going to be super cautious in that because they are claiming knowledge um, that is direct and divine. And by the way, the um, batting average for a prophet, according to Deuteronomy 18, is 100%. If a prophet gets it wrong one time, they're supposed to be stoned. Now, I don't think we're supposed to stone them now, but we treat them like they're dead. We don't keep listening to them. So if you got some of these people that are making some predictions and prophecies, I would recommend turn the TV off or the radio or whatever you're watching YouTube off if you're watching them. Don't turn me off, please. <laughs> um, you might disagree with me on some points, but I think we're gonna, you're going to see that I'm holding fast to the Word of God here. Um, I hope. If I'm not, let me know. Um, and, and we're told to test their teaching, not just to take it and drink it in fully without testing it against the Word of God. They may use Bible references but it's not what the Bible means. Satan quoted scripture when he uh, tempted Jesus in the wilderness. So be cautious. First John 4, 1, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Even in the day of John, false prophets were there. They're here now. And as we get closer to the end, they will be here all the more. Be cautious, brothers and sisters. God grants no room for spiritual adultery among his people. He does not permit a Christian to be involved in uh, the church and worship and belonging to him and in the occult 
or witchcraft or horoscopes and astrology or tarot cards or Hinduism or Buddhism or New Age or Enneagram or yoga. Mm. Um, listen to the, the yogis. They'll tell you, you can't separate the exercises from um, the, the religion behind that. Um, don't, don't blow me up because of that, please. Um, <laughs> Um, but this would also include some of the, um, maybe some of the, the, the secret or social groups, uh, they're called social groups, uh, fraternity groups that are out there. Be very cautious, be very careful. God does not tolerate that and he will deal with that in his way. So what do we learn about Jesus and his church so far? Jesus walks among his churches. He is intimately connected to us. He is Lord of the church. He is the master, not our mascot. We don't parade him out to uh, charge up the church and get us all excited so that we can go out and do the work. He is the one who gives us the marching orders. He gives us the mission, and he gives us the means to do that. We need to follow him, not push from behind, uh, and we need to take him seriously. He expects faithfulness, obedience, and perseverance that we hang on to Jesus for our dear lives, and we never let go. Tribulation will be part of the church's experience. It will be part of your experience as a believer. Jesus takes the purity of his church very seriously. We cannot monkey with this. This is his church. We need to be very careful how we live and act with each other in fellowship with each other, how we talk about each other, how we talk about the church, his bride. Threats to the church can be both external and internal. Let's be careful. But Jesus loves the church enough to protect and to correct. One of the beautiful things is that when we're doing wrong, we have the Holy Spirit who is sent to convict. We have the family of God who is intended to call that out in us because, yeah, Jesus loves us where we are, but he loves us too much to leave us there. So if you got questions or comments, I hope you'll leave those. Hope this has been a helpful episode for you. And certainly if it has uh, in any way been interesting or helpful, uh, please give a thumbs up if you haven't already. Uh, subscribe and catch some of the other uh, episodes that are coming up. And most of all, thank you for watching. It means a lot. I'm honored that you've spent that time with me. And until we see each other again, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. May the Lord richly bless you indeed.